protect us from some of the downside. You usually don't see that um, bear market come through in some of the private equity. Uh, and there's been a global diversification in a way that uh, we weren't at uh, 10 years ago. So the combination of both the asset class diversification along with the global diversification, we believe has put us in a position to weather that. We continue to have, we will have losses. I mean, we're not gonna prevent losses. And one of the true tests of our asset allocation that we haven't seen yet because we're in a nine year bull market is how well we have prepared for that bear market because until it comes, we won't have a good sense. Uh, one of the things also that the investment policies and the board is very good at is being very quick and nimble to react when the need arises uh, to do that on a variety of different fronts. So I suspect that we would be convening very quickly to make sure that the things we've tried to put in place are working as we've expected. Ms. Riddell, thank you. And, uh just like the rodeo that we live in in volatility when it comes to uh, oil and gas production, uh, we have lived in uh, the same rodeo when it comes to investment earnings over time. And so I appreciate the cautionary note of the previous scenario. I know you have another scenario to describe to us, or I believe you do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so let's move on. Uh, w one final uh, point uh, that I have, but Senator Hoffman, please first. Well, well, my point is that I think the, the House and the Senate have passed versions of Senate Bill 26, and I think that uh, the payout that we have, although Senator von Himhoff is talking about a, a stable 5%, the, the House, the Senate's version is even more conservative than that, um, which uh, would, in my view, strongly um, reduce the... the Stress test, and and, and we have a 4.5 to 4.75 percent, which is um, much more conservative, um, and in my view is uh, protects the the corpus and protects the the balance of the ERA, and I'm wondering if you might comment on that. Uh, through the chair, Senator um, Hoffman, that is the next scenario that I'm going to walk through. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Riddell, the last uh, thought that I wrote down um, was the, um, the move last year to uh, take all of uh, the money from the ERA to fund government. And the shock that uh, reverberated based on that move uh, with board members and the corporation itself. And so, uh, one of our uh, senators have, has named it the turducken, uh, that we somehow, uh, the, the House in its wisdom uh, decided that it would be a good idea to place the capital budget inside of the operating budget, take all the money from the ERA and cut and run. That's, that's a Senate version. I mean that tongue in cheek. Our, our colleagues were just as frustrated as the Senate was um, in uh, trying to reach a compromise and felt like that was an option that they would uh, place on the field for consideration. I mean that with all respect. But if you could just briefly talk uh, at this finance committee table, how that uh, vibrated in your world as far as management and why we're seeing, uh, which again, I appreciate uh, uh, the lights on scenario, make sure, Senate Finance, that you understand that there can be a down market. Make sure, Alaska, that you understand we live in volatility that we do not control, we manage. So we are at the rodeo, we are riding on interest as a source of income. We are at the rodeo riding uh, on a commodity um, and we have some uh, less uh, robust uh, Broncos or whatever you ride at a rodeo, bulls some more tame, some older ones that uh, provide earning in the form of tourism and, and other things. So we're, we're, at, we're participating. Uh, can you just speak to, uh, not a good analogy, I'm sorry. I just don't know sports well enough to get on a football field and talk about 
blitzes or whatever those things are. <laughs> Um, Madam Chair, going back to your um, question about, uh, uh, I guess, the legislative session um, in 2017, uh, there was a lot of discussion, as I said at the, at the beginning of my remarks, about um, how, to use, how to use the fund. And we need, at the fund, approximately we keep about a billion dollars of cash on hand um, in order to, whether it's to fund operations, to pay external managers, <clears throat> but also to meet those capital, those capital calls. Um, as the debate was happening, it looked like to us from the outside looking in that there was consensus building around this $2.5, $2.7 billion draw that was going to be in SB 26, which I believe sort of coalesced in March sometime. And so we started pointing our cash reserves towards a three and a half billion dollar mark. So the one billion for ourselves, the two and a half billion for the state of Alaska. Um, in terms of planning, that's really important because we then are not going to deploy that cash into an illiquid asset class such as, pri such as private equity because we know we can't get it back out to then turn over to Treasury. And even knowing that um, it might be July 1st or it might be September 1st or it might even be January 1st when Treasury needs that money, it meant that we were going to be in a short-term duration, three to nine months of use of that fund, which argues for moving in into very liquid fixed income securities that aren't going to lose value. So that is the tactic that we took. Um, then the debate continued on, and the amount moved off of that two and a half billion, roughly two and a half billion dollar mark, moved up closer to five billion. Uh, and then ultimately resulted in a total draw of about $725 million. And so we immediately, once that $725 million draw was settled on and agreed upon and wasn't going to change, uh, we immediately deployed that last week in June, uh, that excess over the 1.7, so that we held the billion dollars for us, the 725 million for the state, and the balance was then immediately deployed into the markets, into primarily the public equities and fixed income, because they're the most liquid, and then we've been moving it into private assets as they become available. Senator Hoffman, did you have a question? No. Um, Ms. Rodell, there is this notion that's traveling through the legislature this year about advanced funding a portion of the budget. I know that you and I met uh, in regards to your constitutional authority and whether you had it or not to actually deploy money managers on the behalf of Alaskans in the case of a, a government shutdown. Do you have any comments for that? Certainly, uh, I would be protective of both uh, the retirement board uh, in being able to provide benefits to Alaskans, as well as the Permanent Fund Corporation in its ability to manage a huge asset if that conversation gains any legs in either one or both bodies, because I uh, believe that you need the statutory authority to operate. Can you speak to that? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. We are required to have an appropriation to operate. And so that appropriation pays for both the corporate operations as well as those external manager contracts where we write actual checks. They're, they're not um, a net of fee arrangement. And so in the event of a shutdown, we have made provisions with the custodial bank, Bank of New York Mellon. There are also those provisions that would come into effect if there were a tsunami that prevented us from getting in and managing the fund. There are emergency um, procedures, and they would take over management of the fund, but they wouldn't actively manage. So in other words, they're going to act as the receiver and collect and book those income receipts, but they're not going to make reinvestment decisions. 
they're not going to make active management decisions. So if the market goes sideways, they're not going to take action to mitigate that. Thank you. Moving on to slide 31. So this was the second scenario, which was to um, continue with that five and a quarter percent for years one and two, recognizing that there needed to be sort of a budgetary glide path uh, into an ongoing um, endowment or an in, in ongoing draw of four and a half percent in years three through ten. So as you would expect, that required annual return then steps down because the required amount is stepped down. So in this scenario, in order to maintain both the $13 billion in the earnings reserve as well as the $7 billion in the unrealized gain, you would need to earn an annual return of 5.9% over the next 10 years. In order to maintain that $13 billion um, the $7 billion in unrealized but utilize all of the earnings reserve account requires an annual return of 4.1%. And then you would exhaust both the earnings reserve account and the unrealized gain if you only earned 2.9% annual return. And just to sort of give some context to this, fixed income 10-year treasury rates are slightly below 2.9% today. So if this were all in treasuries, you would exhaust the earnings reserve account as well as the, as the um, uh, unrealized gains. Senator Von Imhoff. Um, Ms. Rodell, do you think that if we um, didn't have the bump down, as in we started, we did not start at five and a quarter and either bumped it to five or four and a half, if we just started it at five? Um, how would, in your opinion, how would this risk profile shift? Uh, through the chair, Senator Von Himoff, I think it would shift, both of them would, well, the other one would shift down slightly. This might shift, um, shift up slightly because you're doing a seven-year period at five rather than a seven-year period at four and a half. So they would probably meet somewhere between the 5.9 and the 6.3%. <coughs> Okay, so through the chair, you don't think the the shock at the beginning of five and a quarter has that much of an effect that both would shift down in risk if we just limited it that quarter? Through the chair, uh, no. And part of that is because you're while you're eliminating the shock in this scenario for the first two years, you're increasing the distribution requirement in years three through ten from four and a half to five. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? Please continue. Um, and you can see, and I think I think this would be intuitive that then the odds of falling short, um, or if you, the odds of falling short go down as well. So, the odds of falling short, or the odds of maintaining and making that 5.9 percent annual return would actually be 56 percent. So better than half. Um, uh, one out of two chance that you would make your 5.9% return. Ms. Rodell, is your staffing level affected at all by um, the proposals that have been before the legislature? Will you need more staff to manage more uh, volatility or uh, more liquidity? Madam Chair, our staffing levels are affected more by, believe it or not, I would say um, the, pl the plan. So in the sense of not knowing what the environment is going forward makes it hard for us um, to determine the best route. I mean, we, we keep talking about internal versus external management. And the biggest value of internal management is really in the private markets, but that's a very illiquid place to be. And so if the plan going forward is going to require us to maintain higher degrees of liquidity, it's less likely that we would put those internal resources into something like private markets um, because that asset allocation is going to have to go down or stay uh, where it currently potentially is 
possibly. Um, and it's because of the not, not knowing going forward. So this is all <coughs> speculative. And part of it is, too, because if you remember, those spending plans or those staffing plans are built two years out. So it's where you want to be at the end of a fiscal year cycle, not at the beginning of the fiscal year, because you don't have all those people on board on day one. You're using the course of the fiscal year and the, and the budgetary authority you've been given to build up those staffing levels and be in a certain place at the end of the year. So we're putting together a two-year business plan without um, having clarity as to what the fund should look like given any p possible changes. So we're having to, to do it as if the current environment is going to continue. Thank you. Please continue. So on slide 33, we applied the same stress test that you saw earlier to the new five and a quarter percent, stepping down to the four and a half percent. And in this case, you can see that the cumulative distributions are lower, um, and that should be expected because you're taking less at four and a half percent. But you still have the same effect of a big market sell-off uh, in the second year of 30 percent with a 27 percent recovery the following year. So if I can move on to the comparison between the two, um, you'll see that um, the two are, are fairly close, but they do provide uh, a range of outcomes. Um, at the end of 10 years, based on Callan's um, capital market forecast, you would have distributed under the base case a total of 31 billion 521 million, which is different than the stress case. This is just under a, the mean median um, outcomes. You will have distributed 31 billion, and in the reduced distribution, a total of 29 billion. The fund will have grown to 75.3 billion, or 78.2 billion under the lower 4.5% draw. The earnings reserve will continue to accumulate at 14.3 billion. You will have built up an unrealized gain because we don't do any rebalancing, so those unrealized gains are allowed to accumulate to 21.4 billion, and you will have not missed in any inflation-proofing payments. So this is the median case under these scenarios where you earn 6.3% and 5.9%. Ms. Ardell, when the legislature added additional funds to the permanent fund corporation through its revenue, that's just taken as more versus inflation proofing because of the statutory language that was used? Uh, that is correct. And in those years, the legislature also appropriated specific inflation proofing payments. Thank you. Um, this is just an appendix I included for your information, our December 31st financial statements. I won't go through them unless there are specific questions you have. And I would just um, offer up any other questions, but that concludes our presentation. Questions from committee members. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Going back and looking at the governor's budget, um, uh, it's portrayed that we have about a $2.5 billion deficit. Um, and notwithstanding, we're looking at uh, 26 or what are we, how the permanent fund is going to be utilized. But if, but if you look at his $2.5 billion um, deficit, he's also short funding um, credits that may not happen if we don't sell the bonds, about 200 million and maybe 60 million in retirement benefits that aren't there. So uh, we could look at um, a deficit of 2.7 to $2.8 billion. And um, on page 11, you're, you're looking at another 2.3 billion that the governor wants to backfill the inflation proofing. And I guess um, that would come from, both of those would come from the ERA. Uh, they total um, north of $5 billion uh, at a hit to the 
ERA. And I'm wondering if that were the scenario, what impact would that have on the, on the fund? Um, through the chair, Senator Hoffman, I think the draw is roughly around $2.6 billion. Um, can't speak to your deficit calculation, but if you added this amount uh, to inflation proofing, what's important to note is this rolls into the corpus of the fund and will be invested in earning the fund's earnings. So this, this will go and be available to all future generations of Alaskans, not just current generations of Alaskans, this amount here. Well, the governor stated that in his plan, we have about a $2.5 billion deficit. Um, but th the problem at this table that we've went over is that he has not included in that calculation tax credits. Uh, if, we, uh, if we went to the statutory uh, amount that is uh, set into law and the uh, retirement uh, shortfall that uh, the chairman has pointed out, we're looking at a $2.7 $2.8 billion um, deficit and uh, without any new revenues that they're the only source besides the CBR which many people feel that um, should be left alone for f uh, for future crises uh, the only the only other source is the ERA and then the governor also plans on trying to um, backfill the inflation proofing and on page 11 when you look at 16 17 18 and 19 that total is 2.3 billion um, which, when you add the two together, that's five billion dollars. So you know, it seems to me that that is um, too large of a number for uh, a one-year hit to the, the the fund balance of the ERA. Ms. Rodell, the um, ERA is invested identical to the permanent fund. Is that accurate? Uh, that is accurate. Both the earnings reserve and the principal own a pro rata share of each investment. And so the $2.3 billion of possible inflation proofing would be a technical book entry versus a reallocation of asset or an actual hit on the fund? Correct. And so the draw still from a financial perspective from uh, the markets would be, uh, if we didn't pass a bill, would be uh, instability in drawing whatever the current budget shortfall is, as uh, Senator Hoffman said, closer, uh, if we count things that haven't been included in the governor's budget of upwards of $2.7 billion versus the 2.1, and under his proposal, I believe, there is a smaller draw on the CBR, which as Senator Hoffman has said, at least we are being advised, is um, not the best possible way to use those remaining assets in the CBR. Like the permanent fund is holding in reserves a billion dollars to respond to market or legislative or administrative activities, uh, the legislature should hold, um, according to our budget, uh, you know, best case scenario, one year's reserves of general funds, which would be closer to $5 billion, 4.5, 4.8 eight billion dollars where we're down to as i'm recalling from yesterday help me senators about 2.5 remaining 2.4 um senator machicki did you i think it's 2.2 isn't it uh senator machicki is saying it might be 2.2 billion dollars and so that's why uh, senator hoffman is raising the issue of the draw from the constitutional budget reserve i just want to make sure i'm accurate in uh in you large ways around that that conversation any other questions from committee members uh, for the Permanent Fund Corporation? Senator Machiki. I just have one on that subject. I mean, on a year. You know, so, so we're a little tighter now on the CBR, right, than we were in the past. But just the difference in earnings last year, if you, if you had $5 billion sitting in savings at a 12% year, $600 million, right? Yes. I mean, we've literally, the way that we manage, um, the CBR has literally cost us, you know, many billions of dollars over the years. Do you have suggestions on a better way? I mean, in respecting the constitutional requirement of a CBR, yet managing um, the need for 
some liquidity in those funds. I mean, liquidity has uh, has a bottom line. It seems like we've been unnecessarily prepared for liquidity through the years, and that's been a very expensive way to manage our liquid assets. Um, through the chair, Senator Machiki, you know it's it's been a challenge for revenue commissioners over the over the years from when the sub account was first created and the recognition that as balances built up that there was a portion of that if you remember could be invested and then it was promptly lo lost because it was inv invested right at the height right before the loss so it is a challenge and i think it it does need to be recognized that um that that money is being re relied upon it's kind of like the discussions we have at our households about what is the appropriate amount to have in savings. Do you have six months worth of living expenses, 12 months worth of living expenses in the case of a bad, a bad event, in, in case of an emergency as to what you should have? And so I think the question you have to ask yourself is what is the purpose of that fund? Is it to act as a cushion or is it to fund government? and invest accordingly. Because investing as a cushion where you don't expect to use it is a very different strategy than actually using it to fund troopers and education, teachers, and all the other things that Alaskans are relying on the state to pay for. Senator Machicki. I think there's an in-between though, right? I mean, there's the, uh, your asset allocation in the permanent fund that you're looking for a maximum return, and then there's what we have done with the CBR in the past. There's probably something in between that guarantees a greater return, yet still has a level of conservatism that delivers. Um, through the chair, Senator Machicki, th I think what's written in statute is actually, it's really interesting, right? It has like a three-year duration target in statute as to what it can be invested in. And the challenge has been this, and it goes to Bridgewater's observation about the returns on those investments are at historical lows and we're seeing cash rates at 1.3% versus the 3% we saw in the past. So I think what you're struggling with is the recognition that you have to take a lot of risk to get any return these days, and it's been that way for a while. And you're not, and if you're willing to take the risk and direct and change the statutes and direct the Department of Revenue to take that risk, they'll take that risk. But right now, their hands are bound by what's in statute on the CBR. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Other questions from committee members? Just a statement, Madam Chair. Senator Hoffman. <clears throat> the CBR was classified as a rainy day nay fund in cases of emergency the, um, to be used for several things, including the operation of government. So the question is, when okay. is it raining? <laughs> Senator Hoffman, we're in Juneau, Alaska. I believe it's situated inside of a rainforest. <laughs> but it's sunny today. <laughs> it is a beautiful day in Juneau. Um, Ms. Riddell, thank you for uh, presenting uh, in front of Senate Finance today. Uh, Mr. Moran, do you have any closing comments from uh, for consideration of the Senate Finance Committee on bills that might be uh, either in committee uh, uh, or otherwise that could affect um, the management of Alaska's uh, prize jewel, Alaska's permanent fund? Not, not directly to any of the, uh, the um, legislation, but I think you know from from the from the board standpoint, I think we would like to emphasize that as long as we have the the two tiered deal, the principal and the earnings reserve, th that it would be a mistake to underestimate the importance of the annual inflation proofing. Um, the, the, the change in purchasing power over time is, has a compounding effect. And when we look at the goal of managing for future generations, um, we, we can inadvertently shortchange those longer term values by not recognizing the inflation costs on an ongoing basis. 
Senator Olson. So, Mr. Moran, are you <clears throat> confirming the fears that many of us have in the that have investments that in the near future there's going to be hyperinflation as predicted at least by my accountant? No one can predict the future. <laughs> I realize that, but it sounds like the double-digit inflation, the double-digit hyperinflation that I've been cautioned about, is uh, almost inevitable. You don't have to comment if you don't want. To. I'm just asking yeah, if you I, want to confirm I, I, it. I'm, I'm not an expert on on that, but I do understand c compound interest and the compounding effect and s small changes in in the purchasing power turn into large dollar amounts over a long period of time, and it's important to, you know, to recognize that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Olson. Uh, is it fair that the uh, board uh, resolution still stands that uh, the people should vote on uh, a percent of market uh, value draw? You, have a, you had an active uh, resolution giving guidance to the people of Alaska from the board's perspective on how to manage uh, the assets. Is that still an active resolution? We, we've discussed that a number of times over the years, and the board's still in favor of a POMV um, a, approach to the dis distributions from the fund. A percent of market value yes. uh, draw? Yes. Thank you. Senator Von Imhoff, did you have a question? I was going to say, well done. With that, um, I would like to advise the committee that um, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, we will have the mental health budget in front of us. On Thursday, um, a presentation update uh, on the Alaska LNG project, and on Friday, a uh, deferred maintenance update. Uh, I know that some of those might be riveting conversations to, to some and maybe not so to others, but it's all important to the business uh, of the people of Alaska. So I thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the comments and uh, look forward to future conversations. With that, we're adjourned.